The winter of 1777 and 1778 at Valley Forge is one of those quintessential moments in American history. It's that moment in filmmaking that we call all is lost. It's a point about two thirds or three quarters of the way through the movie where the protagonist has totally lost it. It is that moment in American history where all is lost. Imagine it's December 25th. Christmas Day, and what are you doing as a soldier? You want to be home in the warm. Instead, you're out here in the snow making a cabin, building a cabin from the logs around you with primitive tools, just wood and mud and sticks. And you have to make a hut so that you can live the entire winter and stay warm so you can train. At the end of the military campaign season of 1777, Washington withdrew his troops into a rural area about 20 miles away from Philadelphia. Now imagine this, 11,000 men, and you're going into a completely open area with fields, some hills, some woods. That's it. You've got to make a small town for all these men. This area was just 20 miles away from Philadelphia. That's the capital city, and it's occupied by the British. This is an amazing circumstance if you think about it. And they set up camp at the end of December. They set up their tents, and it is cold, four inches of snow on the ground. Right after they set up camp, Washington declares a day of Thanksgiving, but the supplies are meager. Some people get an actual meat ration and others deal with just the meagerest food. The army is basically short of everything you can imagine. There are problems with shoes, pants, socks, hats. There's not enough food. There isn't enough equipment. There aren't enough tents and it's winter time. Washington says, let's build huts or cabins for all the men. So he sets the men to work on cabins. There aren't really enough tools. It takes a month before everyone is under an actual roof. The cabins they build are just like the cabin that we've got here, approximately 15 feet wide and maybe 20 feet long. They may be six feet at the wall edge at the max, and they have very, very simple rugged roofs made out of shingles or whatever they can get a hold of. Can you imagine? This is the size of a small city today, and you have to make this happen immediately. You basically all walk into this area and say, let's make a town. And they do something exactly like that. Rules and regulations start to come out right away to organize these men into a working city. Immediately, they start to work on things like gathering up the supplies they need to make soap. Anyone who has experience with that kind of thing, they're set aside. Gather up all the ashes, gather up all the fat. You have to make soap because these men need that. They also gather up all the men who have any experience tailoring or working with fabric so that they can start to make new uniforms. You can imagine there's a little bit of lawlessness in this situation. You've got men that don't have enough supplies and they're going to go out and steal or get supplies whatever way they can. The officers in General Washington have to deal with this right away and they make regulations. They make sure that men just can't leave camp whenever they want to. They make sure that you can't shoot off guns unless you have permission. And they make some very strict rules about the people that go out into the countryside and how they are acquiring the goods that they're getting from the civilians in the area around. They do make sure that as they get supplies, if they don't have money to give people that they are taking the supplies from, they give them a receipt so that they can get paid back, hopefully in the future. But unfortunately, as the money inflates in the time period, many of these folks probably never got reimbursed at all. This is a rebuilding time for the army. They're resting as it were, and they're retraining and they're resupplying if possible. And supply was difficult, especially clothing. Something like a quarter of the men didn't have a shirt and a different quarter of the men didn't have proper footwear or maybe shoes at all. If you're marching out in the snow and you don't have proper shoes, they would take their blankets and cut them up. Of course, 
if you take your blanket and cut it up, then you don't have a blanket. To make matters worse, we have health problems. A lot of the men are sick, they have things like the itch or dysentery, typhus is going through the camp at that time. And if you've built a little city, you also have to build little hospitals. And so they had little hospital areas around here and they had a problem where the men would go into the hospital with their clothing and it would get stolen. And once they got well again, they came out of the hospital and they had no equipment whatsoever. The question is, how do you feed 11,000 men in a setting like this? We have a small city of men that have just come off of a military campaign and they are worn out. They could have possibly set up in a larger city where there were you know, more supplies and lots of farmers. This is very, very challenging to feed an army. We have many, many accounts of just how few supplies there were to work with. Yes, they were going out and scouring whatever they possibly could from the area, but there are complaints over and over about the amount of food. Here's a reading from a soldier to his father at home, and he's writing about being in Valley Forge. And he says, On the day appointed for the continental Thanksgiving, we drew a half a gill of rice per man, with which our beef and flour were the dainties of our feast. And then he says, We are now about to build huts for shelter this winter, we have uh, nothing convenient to work with. Axes are very scarce. Everything was very scarce and food was extremely scarce. We also have a diary from a surgeon who was at Valley Forge. He was sick at this time and his, his diary is just replete with depression. And he complains and complains. He's so sick he really can't eat anything, but there isn't anything to eat anyway. But he talks about the other soldiers around him. Preparations are made for huts, provisions scarce. Hardly wish myself at home. My skin and eyes are almost spoiled with continual smoke. A general cry through the camp this evening among the soldiers, no meat, no meat. The distant veils echo back the melancholy sound, no meat, imitating the noise of the crows and owls, and almost made it a part of confused music. What have you for dinner, boys? Nothing but fire cake and water, sir. At night, gentlemen, the supper is ready. What is your supper, lads? Fire cake and water, sir. Very poor beef has been drawn into the camp the greater part of this season. Joseph Plum Martin also mentions this Thanksgiving with nothing but rice and vinegar. It sounds like some of the troops had some other supplies. Yes, some had meat, some had a little bit of flour. Others, they only got the rice and vinegar. So today we're going to be making up a simple rice and vinegar and a few fire cakes. And that will be the feast for our Valley Forge soldiers. There are times in history when we have looked at this story of Valley Forge, the time right after Washington's death, and also during the Civil War and after the Civil War. When we started to look at this story, the popular public opinion can seem like it's very, very exaggerated. But the reality of this story, when you look at the numbers and the diary entries and the letters home, it seems like maybe you can't over-exaggerate this. It was probably that bad. Okay, maybe there weren't as, as many bloody tracks in the snow as you might hear in some of the stories, but there probably were bloody tracks in the snow. There were situations that we just really can't quite imagine today. With the harsh conditions and the lack of supplies, mutiny was a problem. And the officers and General Washington especially had to think about this problem. How do we keep these men in order? And they had problems at different times during the winter. Men without supplies demanded something. They wanted more and they said they would riot without it. So how do you deal with that? That was one of the problems in general that Washington had. He had men from different colonies and all these different colonies had very different cultures. I don't think we can get our heads around that today. We're a very homogenous United States compared to the individual colonies at the time. They were very different. How do you bring these men together? 
I love the Master and Commander series by Patrick O'Brien, and the captain has to deal with this same problem many times on board ship. He has men that are old sailors and new sailors and people that don't have any experience at all. People from different ships all coming together under a new command. How do you weld them together into a solid fighting force? That was his challenge. He would hope for a naval engagement right away, a fight to bring these men together, or a very, very strong storm so that they had to fight for their lives. That would weld them together into a single fighting force. And I believe that's what General Washington was hoping for. A situation that is difficult for the men to get through. Something they had to fight together to make it through. And that's what welds this army together from these disparate colonies. And now it's a single fighting force. And they come out of it in the spring together, retrained, resupplied, and ready for another year of campaigning.